So let's say we want to find the limit as x approaches e of sine of pi over 2 times ln x. One way that we can do this limit is to bring the sine to the outside of the limit. So this equals the sine of the limit as x approaches e of pi over 2 times ln x. So we can just switch the sine and the limit. But wait, can we actually do that? Can we just take this sine function that's inside of the limit and bring it to the outside? Does this give us the same answer? The answer is yes, it does give us the correct answer. And in this video, we're going to look at why. And I want to investigate a more general statement. The question is, when can we switch a limit and a function? So say we have the limit as x approaches some value c of f of g of x. And we want to know, when does this equal f of the limit as x approaches c of g of x? So when can we take this function f and bring it to the outside of the limit? And there are two conditions that we need for this to work. The first condition is we need f to be continuous. So f is a continuous function. And we need to know that the limit as x approaches c of g of x exists. So if this inside limit here has a value and the function f is continuous, then we can switch the limit and the function. And the proof of this statement here is one of the examples of why the epsilon delta definition of a limit is very important. Because when we're looking at specific functions like sine and cosine and x squared and so on, it can seem kind of unnecessary to do epsilon delta proofs for everything. Because if we're looking at those kinds of functions, we can just plug in the value or see what it approaches as x approaches a specific number. But when we're looking at an arbitrary function f, we don't know what the function values are, but we still want to prove something important that we can switch that limit in the function. And if we don't know what the function is, the best way to do this proof is to look at the original epsilon delta definition of the limit and see if we can prove it from there using just those fundamental principles. So the epsilon delta definition of a limit is very useful for proving results about general functions because it's how we define limits in the first place with that epsilon delta. So let's look at the proof of this statement right here. We're going to assume that the function f is continuous and that the limit of g of x right here exists. So let's say that the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals l. We know that this limit exists, we assume that at the beginning, so it has to equal something and we're just going to call that limit l. So if we look at the thing on the right side here, f of the limit of g of x, this is going to be f of l. So our goal now is to take this left side, the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x, and prove that that equals f of l. So right here, we're looking at a limit. So if we want to prove that this limit equals something, we're going to need the epsilon delta definition. Now the epsilon delta definition says that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero such that zero less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta implies that the distance from this inside function f of g of x to the limit value, which is f of l, is less than epsilon. If we want to prove that this statement is true for every epsilon greater than zero, what we can do is start by taking some arbitrary value of epsilon. Say we take any epsilon that's greater than zero, and we just have to show that there exists a delta that satisfies this condition. Right now, we don't know anything about the limit of f of g of x, but we do know about the limit of g of x because we assume that that limit exists and it equals l. 
So the limit as x approaches c of g of x has to satisfy this epsilon delta definition, which means that there exists delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than x minus c less than delta implies the distance from g of x to l is less than epsilon. So we now know that g of x can be really close to l if we pick a small delta. But we want to know that f of g of x is really close to f of l. So if we know that these two insides, g of x and l, are close to each other, how do we know that f of g of x and f of l are also close to each other? That's where this first condition comes in, saying that f is continuous. Now the definition of a function f being continuous is that the limit as t approaches l of f of t equals f of l. And this has to be true for every value of l. So let's see what that means in terms of the epsilon delta definition of a limit right here. We have some epsilon greater than zero. So because this limit of f of t has to equal f of l, we can just read off the rest of the definition. Since this limit exists, it has to satisfy this definition. So we have an epsilon greater than zero. That means that there exists some alpha greater than zero. I'm using a different letter than delta just to show that it's a different number than this one, such that if t minus l is a distance less than alpha, then that implies f of t minus f of l is less than epsilon. Now when we look at this statement down here about alpha greater than zero, this applies anytime we have some number t that's a distance from l less than alpha. But in particular, instead of looking at t, I'm going to substitute in g of x. And we can do that because this statement down here, this implication, has to work for any number. So if g of x is a distance less than alpha from l, then f of g of x has to be a distance less than epsilon from f of l. So now we have a statement up here that says g of x minus l is less than epsilon. What we really want is a distance g of x minus l to be less than alpha, because then we can apply this second condition. But the thing to realize is that this second statement where we say there exists a delta greater than zero, that has to be true for every positive number, for any number here that's greater than zero. But we have a number down here that's greater than zero, and it's alpha. So what we can do is find a value of delta here, this delta greater than zero, not so that it applies to epsilon, but so that it applies to alpha, the same alpha that we choose down here. So now we have an alpha greater than zero, such that if the distance from g of x to l is less than alpha, the distance from f of g of x to f of l is less than epsilon. But we know that if x minus c is less than delta, then this condition is going to be satisfied. So we start with our epsilon greater than zero, and we say what happens if the distance from x to c is less than delta? We know that this delta exists from the definition of the limit for g of x, and we're asking what happens if x minus c is less than delta? From this first condition, we know that the distance from g of x to l is less than alpha. But by the definition of alpha, if the distance from g of x to l is less than alpha, then this second condition also has to be true. So this implies that the distance from f of g of x to f of l is less than epsilon. We've proved that if the distance from x to c is less than delta, then this absolute value expression is less than epsilon. 
But this is exactly what we need for the epsilon delta definition of a limit. We say let epsilon greater than zero, then there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the distance from x to c is less than delta, then the distance from this inside expression in the limit to the limit value we want is less than epsilon. So we have now proved that the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x equals f of l. I should also point out the possibility here that what happens if g of x equals l, because that's allowed. If g of x equals l, then this absolute value is less than alpha. So this expression down here doesn't work anymore because then the distance from g of x to l equals zero. So we don't get the implication. But if g of x equals l, then obviously f of g of x equals f of l because the inputs to the function are the same. So this absolute value expression is also zero, and that means it's less than epsilon. So we're all good, no problem with the special case there. So that is the proof for why we can switch the limit and the function as long as that outside function is continuous and the inside limit exists. The way we do that is using the epsilon delta definition of the limit. And in this case, we have to use it twice. We use it once for the inside limit of g of x, and we use it once for the continuous function to show that if these two inputs are close to each other, then the outputs from f also have to be close to each other. So that is the power of the epsilon delta definition of the limit.